number three, God himself is with us.
No? No? No. I have to stay in one place. It's going to be difficult for me. Um, today is uh, our Pathfinder and Adventurer Day. Uh, this is why I am dressed in all of my regalia. Um, so for those of you that want to stay for the second service, uh, the family service where we're going to be having the, uh, the investiture, uh, please feel free and uh, welcome you to uh, join with us. Relationships that love, um, the topic that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, mainly found in the book of Matthew chapter 22. Um, you got a radio mic for me? into the word. Um, dear Father in heaven, it's your time now. Speak through me, help me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> board meeting has been called. Normally when board meetings are called, nobody turns up. But for some reason, the room was packed. Picture the scene in your mind with me, this uh, uh, small room behind uh, the temple, uh, uh, the smell of uh, the midday burnt sacrifices uh, wafting through the room and uh, there's this strange commotion and this hustle and bustle that is uh, going on within the room. Suddenly there is silence as this uh, big, long-bearded man stands up and uh, silences the crowd. There is only one item on the agenda. And uh, this item seems to be the reason why uh, everybody has come to this board meeting. How can we discredit Jesus? Oh, the room uh, uh, erupts. Everybody starts throwing out their suggestions and, 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 and trying to figure out different ways in which we can. Yes, I'm on. Yeah. Trying to figure out different ways in which we can discredit Jesus. Many a times Jesus has gone around and he's been uh, preaching these parables and he's been making us scribes and Pharisees look bad. And so we need to find a way to, to put him down, to make him look small. And uh, people are throwing out all different types of suggestions. And they're discussing it, but nothing seems to be hitting the mark. Nothing seems to uh, be doing the job that they need to really make Jesus look small. So everybody's uh, pondering over this one thing. Uh, how can we do this? What can we do? All of a sudden... Someone from the legal department stands up. I have it. I know how we can discredit Jesus. Uh, let me explain, brothers and sisters, he says. For years, we in the rabbinical school have been uh, fighting over which is the greatest commandment. You, you, you see, we have uh, so many laws. We have 248 which are negative and 365 that are positive. We, we have so many laws and, and, and whatever happens, whatever he chooses, we can discredit him in some sort of way. And, 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 and this lawyer says, listen, if we ask him what is the greatest commandment, he has to go to the devil. He has to go to the ten. He has to go to the... Man, please sit down. He has to go to the ten. He has to go to the devil. The ones that have been written with the finger of God. But how can he say that one is greater than the other? How can he say that remember the Sabbath day is uh, greater than having no other God before me. How can he say that thou shalt not kill is it, better than thou shalt not steal or commit adultery? Oh, there is a round of applause. The room erupts and everybody saying, uh, give this man a promotion. This is fantastic. And, and, and they have spent all this time scheming and plotting. And, 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 and just picture the next day that they go 
up to Jesus. And there is this air of sarcasm in their voice. Teacher, teacher, uh, please tell us, what is the greatest commandment? Well, what is the most important commandment in the word of God? <laughs> and this is why I love Jesus. All of this scheming, all of these board meetings, uh, there is no hesitation, repetition, stammering. And Jesus says the most important commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. And the second is just as important as it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Picture that scenes. Uh, uh, picture the scene that, that I can just imagine how they just kind of cower away and, and, and oh, we, we never thought of that. But here Jesus has told us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind and with all thy soul. And, and the second is just important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now here's the interesting thing, Jesus doesn't leave us in suspense about who is our neighbor when you look at the story of the uh, Good Samaritan, you know, anybody that is anybody can be your neighbor. And here's where we have the problem. Here's where we have a big problem. And I don't know if you guys can relate to me, but there are some people, when you see them on a Sabbath morning, they turn your sunshine into darkness. They, they turn your clear skies into rainy days. You, you know those people that when you see them, you're, you're like, oh man. You, you have to kind of try and avoid them because they, they really know just how to get under your skin. They know how to uh, grate you up the wrong way. You know those people. Those are the people that Jesus is saying, you need to love. And that's quite difficult. That's, that's hard. That's where our, our Christianity really meets uh, uh, the rubber meets the road of our Christianity. Because we now need to love people that mm, sometimes may be unlovable. Now you cannot love without relationships. You need to have relationships with people. We can't just say, oh, I, I love you and stand afar and do nothing and not interact with you. I need to interact with you. I need to have relations with you. And here strikes the second problem. We live in a society where relationships are very much on the decline. Good quality relationships. When we look at the family structure, have you ever seen this? Uh, you might have a big family gathering around about Christmas. Dad is watching TV. Mum is in the kitchen. Son is playing computer games. Daughter is on the phone. Uh, everybody's in the same room, but nobody's talking. Very fragmented. No, not spending quality time to build up relationships. And so the family home, the family structure it is starting to be a little bit diluted because uh, we're not spending good time and investing good time in our relationships. Now, the church is built up of families. And, and, and so if the church is built up of families and the family structure is, is really under attack from the devil, so when we come into church and, and we all call each other brother and sister and we all say that we love one another and we have relationships, but really and truly our relationships uh, are consisting of coming to church on a Sabbath, sitting in front or behind of somebody for three hours and then going home. So I'm, I'm in a, a church structure with people that I'm supposed to be having relations with, that I'm supposed to be loving, but in truth, it's very superficial. And so what happens when somebody goes into hospital, 
somebody falls sick. Nobody goes and visits them because there wasn't really a relationship there to begin with. I say that I love you and I do it in word, but when the rubber hits the road, I'm, because there isn't much there, it's really the pastor and the elders that should be doing the visiting. And then, when the inevitable happens, when there is a disagreement or an argument between us within the church, here's where you really start to see fractured relationships because you fight for the people that you care about. When you have an a, a, a argument within your relationship, or within your marriage, within uh, your, your family, I, I have to fight for this because I care about you. I, I have a, a, a relationship with you. But when that happens in church, I don't really have a relationship with you. And so I don't really have an invested interest to try and mend this relationship. And so what happens is when somebody does me wrong, Instead of fighting and making myself uncomfortable and going approaching that person and saying, what you did offended me, it hurt me. I, I don't want to do that because I didn't really have that much of a relationship with you in the first place. And so what I do is I now, instead of going to person A, I go to person C and say, well, listen, do you know what this person did? This is what they did, and so we triangulate our problems, and because I've gone to this person, this person now has a problem with person A, when they never really had an issue with them to begin with. And the difficulty is, is that when you go and speak to these people, when you go and speak to them, I have no issues, I love them. There's no problem. Everything's okay. But there's time for nominations or board meetings, that deep-rooted pain rises to the surface again. Because we didn't really have relationships. There's a pastor from Australia, Pastor Brendan Pratt, and he comes up with this and he says this, he says that uh, we live in a consumer-driven society. And because we are a consumer-driven society, we, we work on this basis that time equals money. And money equals things. And things make me happy. So the more time that I have, my time is worth money. And so the time equals money. And uh, the more money I have is the more things that I can have. Because uh, if I have a nicer house, if I have nicer cars, uh, then that will make me happy. So anything that takes my time ultimately takes my happiness. And so I don't have time to invest in uh, building relationships with people uh, because my time is valuable. You heard people say this? <coughs> my time is worth money and so I don't have time to try and repair relationships that didn't mean anything to me in the first place. And so we have a church that preaches love God, Love your neighbor as yourself. We preach this. But when people come into our church, the reality is, I don't see it. I, I, I don't see what is being preached from the pulpit. I don't feel this community spirit. I don't feel this uh, love and this relationship that is being promoted that I read in the Bible. In our churches, I struggle to see this. <coughs> And it's very difficult when you're, in the, when you're in the midst of it, when you're integrated into that system to, to realize how broken sometimes our churches have become. <coughs> 
But because we are motivated or we have this consumer <laughs> mindset, church becomes an event that I go to and not a lifestyle that I portray. <coughs> I come to church and I sit down for three hours and I, 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 I shake hands with those that I, I, I see as I walk out the door and I don't speak to them or see them until the same time next week. <coughs> I um, you guys know that the South London Conference puts on a camp meeting every year, and we had just come from this camp meeting, and we had had a fantastic time, and uh, you know the preaching was great, and everybody, you know, you're on the mountain top, you're on this spiritual high, and I, I was a leaving camp meeting, and uh, I, I saw this car broken down by the side of the road. Now I'm not a mechanic, but uh, I realized that they had just blown a tire. Now I know how to change a tire. And so I said to my wife, look, let me just stop and help this person because I can help. I am, am able to do that. And so I pulled over to the side of the road and I, 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 I stopped and I, I helped the person. And, and I got speaking to the post person. And, and, and he knew me because obviously I'm a pastor. He sees me at the front. He's like, oh, pastor, how are you doing? Thanks for stopping. Uh, uh, my tire's blown. I didn't know what to do. And I said, oh, yeah, I can help you with this. Do you have a jack? And we changed it together. And he said this to me. I was praying for somebody to stop. Because I don't know how to change a tire. We've just come from cat meeting. And he said the amount of people that I saw driving past who have just left camp meeting, amazed me. And that really hit me. That really hit me because it's like you've got the entire squad, the majority, some of the South England Conference, and, and we see someone by the side of the road and we're all just driving past. Why? Because I don't have a relationship with that person. I, 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 and, and love drives us to build relationships. Can you imagine a church where everybody is striving to just build relationships? So what then? How do we genuinely love our neighbor? How can we realistically love our neighbor. Understand this. The way you show love to God is when you love your neighbor. You are showing love to God. Because you know what? If I was to do a poll here and say, look, who loves God? Everybody raises their hand. We love God. But the way in which you show genuine love to God is by loving your neighbor. Let me illustrate. The way you treat the creation shows how you feel about the creator. The way you treat the creation shows how you feel about the Creator. Early on in my ministry, I think while I was studying at Newbold, I was at a placement in um, Holloway Church, and I would go and visit members. And I would go to parents' houses, and, you know, stuff on their wall and on their fridges. They would have these pieces of paper with just scribble on them. Just scribble. And I was thinking to myself, when I have children, I'm not going to be putting scribble on my wall. I'm just not going to do it. It makes no sense. But now I've had children. If you come to my house, on my fridge, and on my wall, you will see these beautiful pieces of artwork. They are masterpieces. Uh, and, and the way I treat them shows how I feel about the creator. 
when me and my wife were dating, I would, well, I still do do nice things. Uh, but uh, I, I remember I, I would um, go to her flat and uh, tidy the whole flat and um, I would then leave before she got home from work and uh, I, I would put little post-it notes saying, oh, I love you, I, I hope you had a nice day, nice romantic stuff, oh, great. Do you know that my wife still has those post-it notes in a little box? Just pieces of paper. But she values them because the person who created them is what means the most to her. God created all of us. And the way in which you treat the neighbor shows how much you love God. Do you know that you cannot love God without loving your neighbor? And that really blows my mind. It's like, oh no, God, you know, I, I really love you for my heart. Really. But no, the Bible says this. Whoever claims to love God but hates his brother is a liar. 1 John 4 verse 20. To love is an act of intentionality in response to God and others to promote overall well-being. Can you imagine how much impact we would have on one another if we loved one another intentionally? To love intentionally, to actually go out of our way to restore relationships. To build each other up. Can you imagine what this church would look like? <coughs> Let's not love in word, but in deed and truth. Let's just stop preaching this gospel and live it. My appeal today is a simple one. It's a simple appeal. <clears throat> if you know that there is a broken relationship that you have today, go out of your way to restore it. There are so many Bible texts. You know, the Bible says this, you know what? If you know that somebody has something against you. Not that you have somewhat something against somebody. If you know that somebody has an issue with you, leave your gift at the altar. Leave your sacrifice. Leave your offering. Don't come to church until you resolve that. Leave your gift at the altar and go and reconcile with that person. Because the way in which you treat the creature shows how you feel about the creator. That's my appeal. Each and every one of us has a, a, their own life story. We have our own uh, storyline and, and we will know uh, what issues we have. But my appeal today is if you know that, that there is a, a relationship that needs restoring, leave your gift at the altar and go and break yourself. Jesus is clearly stating that the greatest commandment Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is just as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please help us to have relationships that love. Help us to uh, be able to find relationships that we can try and build and develop, dear Lord. We understand that. Sometimes, dear Lord, it's, it's difficult, it's not easy, but give us, your, uh, give us your mind, the mind of Christ, dear Father, that we can continually try to uh, build up relationships with all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the offerings that we've prepared.
our day we have today so that we can come together to worship you, uh, lift our voices in praising your name by singing these beautiful songs. Lord, we are coming as we are with uh, our sin that we bear, so we ask you to forgive us, help us to stand clean before you. Also, we ask you to help us to love each other as you love us too. And as we are about to worship together, study your word, we ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the messages that we are going to, to receive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please sit it. Make an appeal to all of you. So if you have a beautiful uh, story to share in the Sabbath school, worship service, so please uh, make a contact with some of the Sabbath school leaders, either with me, so we would be delighted to have you here and share your story. Today we are delighted that we have uh, our sister Caroline Lawrence. She is going to share a uh, story or presentation. She is the wife of uh, brother John Lawrence. They are regular members in our class that we meet right there in the corner and we are blessed by their uh, presence and their active uh, participation. So, Sister Lawrence, please come. because he was so wise and brilliant in many different areas. Living 1300 years ago, he was one of the earliest historians and theologians in the English church. He is revered as the father of English history because of his book, The Ecclesiastical History of the English Nation. In the book, he describes how the Christian faith came to England. It came, he said, with singing. The early missionaries in England brought a simple lifestyle that the new converts believed, admiring the simplicity of their innocent life and the sweetness of their heavenly doctrine. In one city, he wrote, the Christians came together to meet, to sing and to pray, and soon the king and 10,000 citizens were baptized. Bede wrote and sang his hymns accompanied by his Saxon harp. Our worship services almost always include singing, and although we enjoy singing our hymns and songs, maybe we do not always really think about the words and what inspired the authors to write them. I would like to share with you some of those experiences. Not far from Port Hope, Ontario, stands a monument with this inscription. Four miles north in Pangali Cemetery, lives the philanthropist and author of this great masterpiece, written at Port Hope, 1857. Above the inscription are the words of the beloved hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Joseph Scriven, its author, was a man who had experienced the friendship of Jesus through a life filled with personal tragedy. When Scriven was a young man in Ireland, his fiancée accidentally drowned on the eve of their wedding. Soon after this, he set sail for Canada. He seemed destined to live his life alone with Jesus as his only close friend. In Canada, he determined to be a friend to those in need, and he became known as the Good Samaritan of Port Hope. Scriven never intended to publish this hymn. He wrote the words to accompany a letter to his mother in Ireland when she became ill. He had no material resources to send her, only a reminder that the most perfect of friends, Jesus himself, was nearby. Later, when Scriven himself was ill, a visiting friend noticed the hymn scribbled on a piece of paper near his bed. Did you write this? asked the friend. Well, not completely, Scriven answered. The Lord and I did it between us. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. 
Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come but with a load of care. Precious Saviour, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Two years before his conversion, Charles Wesley was crossing the Atlantic. When a storm arose, he was terrified. He wrote in his journal, The sea streamed in at the sides. It was as much as four men could do by continual pumping to keep her above water. I rose and lay down by turns, but could remain in no posture long. Strove vehemently to pray, but in vain. Later in the afternoon, as the storm reached its peak, he said, In this dreadful moment, I found the comfort of hope. After he returned from America, Charles was converted. One year after his conversion, he wrote this hymn, one of the most famous of the 6,000 hymns that he wrote. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, hide me, O my Saviour, hide, till the storm of life is past. Safe into the haven guide, O receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, ah, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed, all my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. And now one more. Um, more modern hymn. The late 1960s were dark days for Bill and Gloria Gaither. Both of them were struggling with health problems and Gloria was pregnant with their third child. The world around them was swirling with news of the Vietnam War, civil unrest, the drug culture and violence in the streets. Was this any kind of world in which to raise a family? Discouraged and disheartened. They looked for signs of hope. One day in the spring, Bill walked out of his office to inspect a newly paved parking area. Construction workers had covered it with several coats of asphalt. Bill was satisfied with the job that was done, but as he turned, he noticed a tiny blade of grass poking through the layers of rock and tar to reach into the sunlight. In early summer, the baby was born, and when Bill and Gloria brought their child home, they wrote this song of joy, remembering the blade of grass that prospered even in a hostile environment. More important, they remembered that their baby could indeed face uncertain days because Christ lives. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Saviour lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance, this child can face uncertain days 
because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. The year had been filled with tragedy when Horatio Spafford, a 43-year-old Chicago businessman, penned this hymn. He and his wife were still grieving over the death of their son when the great Chicago fire struck and caused them financial disaster. He realized that his family needed to get away, so that autumn he decided to take his wife and four daughters to England. His wife and daughters went ahead on the SS Ville d'Oise. He planned to follow them in a few days. But on the Atlantic, the Ville d'Oise was struck by another ship and sank within 12 minutes. More than 200 lives were lost, including the Spafford's four daughters. When the survivors were brought to shore at Cardiff, Mrs. Spafford cabled her husband with the words, Saved alone. He booked a passage on the next ship. It was while crossing the Atlantic that Spafford penned the words to this hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord on my soul. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. And I hope when that day comes, when the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, we can all say, it is well with my soul. And I hope these little insights will give us a greater appreciation of some of our great hymns and that we will sing them with greater understanding. Amen. Amen. Sorry, the old whistle got be inspired and written those beautiful songs. They come out of their experience. Now the time is we go to our separate groups.